Well, good morning, Tower View. This is your Sunday School lesson. I'm not doing it live today. I'm recording because of all the drive-in church that we're doing and everything else that's going on. I'm going to record this Saturday night. And then I'm number two. I am not doing what's in the Sunday School lesson. Normally, we, we've been going through Explore the Bible series, which is, when you see this, it's backwards in the camera. I get it. And today's lesson for Easter Sunday is a Easter Sunday lesson. And I've decided that I'm going to skip that. Our sermon is on Easter. We had a Good Friday service. And we have been going through the Book of Romans, and we're going to continue to go through the Book of Romans. So we're going to go... Uh, the lesson for next Sunday is in Romans 8, chapter, starting in verse 12. And last week we finished, we did Romans chapter 6, uh, 1 through 14. So I'm going to take, uh, in, the meet, in the middle of that, I'm going to do the last part of chapter 7 and go into chapter 8. So that's what we're doing today. Uh, welcome. If you uh, don't know who I am, I'm Pastor uh, Nelson, Associate Pastor at Tower View Baptist Church. We're a little church on a hill near in, in Kansas City, Missouri, by a water, big colorful water tower that everybody in town calls the World of Fun Water Tower. We're in the neighborhood of Maple Park and Clay Co and Grace Moore, just uh, south of the city of Clay Como in Kansas City, Missouri. Want to find out more about us? Check out our webpage at TowerViewKC.com. You go to TowerViewKC.com slash live. You can see uh, our other videos that we have for to Sunday, the sermon, the songs that we have, and other videos that we have. Check out our Facebook page to see daily devotionals that we have done and Pat, me and Pastor Darren have done. So that's who we are. Um, if you want to call us, if you want to text us, you can do that at 816-368-1330. With that, we're going to go on to our study. And so we've been going through the book of Romans. And so far in the book of Romans, Paul has talked about the nature of creation and sin in chapters 1 and 2. In chapter 3, he's talked about how all of us have sinned. They, there's none of us, no matter what your family background is, is without sin. And that we cannot save ourselves. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But there is salvation, and it comes by faith. And he shows us an example of that faith in chapter 4 with Abraham. Chapter 5, he talks about how faith triumphs and that um, we can, that faith gives us and set, that faith helps us through suffering because it uh, gives us perseverance and endurance and proven character and points us to an eternal hope. Not a hope so, but a steadfast assurance hope in our future. Chapter 6 goes from salvation, what we call justification, into sanctification. Big words, I know. But going from justification is the day of your salvation. You were justified. You were, you were forgiven of your sins. They are no longer held accountable to you. To chapter 6 where he starts talking about sanctification. What do we do as Christians? How do we live? What's the basis for that? What should we say then? Should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Absolutely not. So we're saying that our lives need to change. We need to start getting rid of the sin. And all through chapter 6, he talks about that, how we're slaves to sin. And he continues that in chapter 7. Well, chapter 6 ends with this verse that you can use if you're walking somebody through what is salvation. In chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We earn what we get through sin. It's a wage. It's something that you earn. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. It is not something you earn. It is given to you. And we accept that by faith. It's not something we earn. We don't earn our salvation. We don't earn our justification. It is a gift of God. We have earned death. And in chapter 7, he continues with that thought. In verse 1, it says, Since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? And he gives an example about marriage and how the law and it survives as long as you were alive. But as soon as death happens, the law no longer has power over you. 
And he continues on in verse in chapter in chapter seven, verse seven. What should we say then? Is the law is the law sin? Absolutely not. He, he keeps going with these questions and because like, people try to find excuses to sin. And he said, there is no excuse. The law is not sin. And he goes on and point out that if it wasn't for the law, he wouldn't know what sin is. So the law is from God. It shows us what sin is. And because it shows us what sin is, it sometimes causes us to sin more. It's like when you tell a little kid, he's in a room quietly playing with his toys, and he's not touching anything else. You put something in there and he says, don't touch this thing that you just set down. Now what are they going to do? They want to go see what you told them not to touch, and they're going to touch it. And it's the same way with sin. But that doesn't make it bad. But it points out our unholiness and how much more we need God because of our sin. And that leads us to a dilemma that Paul has. And then we see, we pick that up, and as we, we start studying in chapter 7, verse 14. This is, For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold as a slave to sin. So he, now he's comparing and contrasting the law. He says that the law is spiritual. When he says spiritual, he's referring to godly things, the Holy Spirit. It is a godly thing when it's spiritual. Sometimes in our world, the world spiritual and spirituality get a bummer because it's talking about things that's not from God. It's not about human devices. When you say spirituality, that could mean anything. Yoga is spirituality. When you empty your in, in Eastern meditation, where you empty your mind, that's spirituality. And so, and it can apply to any religion. But in Paul's case, in his context that he is speaking here in Romans, he is a Christian writing to Christians. He is talking about the things of God when he says spiritual. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave to sin. So he's using the slave injury. You were sold to sin. Verse 15. For I do not, under, do not understand what I am doing. Because I do not practice what I want to do. But I do what I hate. Now if I do what I do not want to do. I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it. But it is, in, but it is sin living in me. For I know that there is nothing good lives in me. That is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with... It's easy for me to say. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do what I... For I, verse 19 again. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do... What I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it. It is the sin that lives in me. All right, I'm going to stop right there, verse 20. All right, this is a tongue twister to read. It's a, and it's, it's, it's a doozy to try to follow. Paul is going back and forth, and he does this a lot. He did this in chapter last part of chapter 5, which we didn't study, where he talks about Adam, the sin of Adam, and the righteousness of Jesus. He does the same type of thing. But while we need to read this whole thing to see where he's going, some, you, you also need to slow it down at the same time to pick it apart to see what he's talking about. So when Paul's talking in the book of Romans and in his letters, when he says spiritual, he's talking about the things of God. When he says flesh, when he uses the word flesh or a, a similar words to it, he is talking about our sinful flesh, our sinful body, how we don't do the right things our unsaved souls, so to speak. This body that is that is just prone to is slave to sin, that is condemned to death because of that sin. So let's back up a little bit. For I do not understand what I am doing. So Paul is in a quandary here. He wants to do the right thing. But his body doesn't let him do the right thing. He does what he doesn't want to do. And he does not do what he wants to do. The back four. He wants to do the right thing, but his body does the wrong thing. He doesn't want to do the bad thing, but his body makes him do it anyways. So he's in a quandary. And that's his quandary. He's going back and forth about complaining about this. 
And it's like, is he talking about himself before he was a Christian? No. He is talking about himself now. And another way to look at it is, too, he's talking about somebody who is trying to live the Christian life who um, is trying to live the Christian life without depending on God. You're trying to follow the rules of God without depending on God. Trying to live the Ten Commandments without depending on God. Our bodies, our, our, these sinful bodies, these sinful minds won't let you do that. So, but he's talking to this as a Christian, as a person who is saved, who is a person who is trying to live as Christ. And the frustration it is to live for Christ when you keep not living for Christ. Because you're doing things, you're saying things, your minds are going to places that aren't godly. How do you live? So that's, that's the, think of it, that big picture. You're trying to do the right thing and it's not working. It's like me trying to sew. I understand the concept of sewing. But when I try to take my hand and try to thread, a, 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 take, take, take the, the thread and put it through the eye of the needle, my hands shake too much. I can't do that. I know what I'm supposed to do, but my body won't let me do that. And it, it goes for anything with fine-tuning. You know, if I try to paint a picture and paint something, I know what, you know, what good art looks like, generally speaking. But my mind and my hands don't let me do those things. I can't do straight. I can't do pretty crooked. I mean, I just do crooked. And it's bad crooked. I, I know what it's supposed to look like, and I just can't get it done. And so my mind wants to do the right thing, but my body doesn't let me do it. And it's the same with sin. You know what's righteous. You know what they're supposed to do. But you keep doing the wrong thing. You keep having the wrong attitude. You keep having a bad attitude. Your mind keeps going places it shouldn't go. You keep worrying when you know you're not supposed to worry. And it's a frustrating thing. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the frustration in this. So in verse, go down to verse 18. For I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my flesh. There's nothing good living in this body. Nothing. People aren't inherently good. According to scripture, Paul, what Paul just told us in chapter 3 of Romans, is that there, there's no one righteous, not one. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We can't live a holy life. You are not inherently good. You are inherently sinful. Therefore, inherently evil. And so, there's nothing good here in my flesh. There is nothing good lives in me that is my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. You know, I desire to throw the football like Patrick Mahomes. But there is no ability in this body of mine to do it. I can't throw it as hard or as far as he can. I can't throw it as accurately as he can. And I really can't do a no-look pass. All right? That ain't happening. Um, I can throw it. It ain't going where it's supposed to, though. And so I, I don't have that ability in my body. It's just not there. And it's the same with righteous. I do not use like, well, you're a pastor. You have all kinds of big. God doesn't strike me and, and, and give me, you know, some extra dose of righteousness just because I became a pastor. I am on the same path that you all are on. All of us are on the same path. He's just given me a different role and a different responsibility. But he hasn't given me any, any extra abilities to do it. I must depend on the Holy, same Holy Spirit that you must depend on, that the Apostle Paul depended on, that the disciples depended on, that Jesus sent to us. It's the same Holy Spirit. We're all in the same boat. You are in the same boat as the disciples. You are in the same boat as the Apostle Paul, and so am I. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same Scripture. We have the same God. So this is Paul. He is saying he does 